If we accept and acquiesce in the face of discrimination, then we accept responsibility ourselves. We must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. There is some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. When we discover this, we are less prone to hate our enemies. If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. These are the quotes of the 2021 Black History Oratory Competition. Hello, everyone. I'm Nicole Baker, and welcome. Every year, WJZ shines a spotlight on Black History Month by asking high school students from all across Maryland to write an original essay based on one of these quotes. And for the past 27 years, the students with the top essays perform their orations live before an audience to compete for scholarship prize money. But this year, because of the pandemic, of course, the finalists submitted their speeches to WJZ on video. Now, the format has changed, but the challenge remains the same, to use the power of words to speak up and speak out about the issues that matter. And now we're proud to introduce to you these amazing students as we celebrate Black History and for the first time in our history, announce the winners of the Black History Oratory Competition right here on WJZ. It is not privilege, but persistence that will result in the change we desire. Tyler rushed over to me, no longer as a tyrant nor a gladiator, but as my brother. He saw the tears streaming down my face. He carried me upstairs like a wounded soldier from a battlefield. When I think of the word forgiveness, I like to think of it as a type of superpower. Through forgiveness, we can all learn to eradicate hate anger and prejudice with love and understanding. Because it is by our mistakes that we learn and gain experience and therefore it is by our mistakes that we live. No matter what room you walk in, what gender or race the majority is, how many faces there may be, make them hear your voice. If I've learned one thing during my 15 trips around the sun, it's that you are only as small as you portray yourself. There will be favoritism everywhere you go, and it's up to you whether you submit to the favoritism and use it as an excuse to give up, or use it as motivation to work even harder. If you harness the intelligence to contribute to someone else's success, then you can create your own. No need to accept discrimination when you can ignore the discriminators. Life puts us in all kinds of situations, yet it is how we handle ourselves within these situations that determines our character. If we let others constantly try to dictate and ordain us to cruel rules, then there will never be a change in the world. The grown-up's table is an invalid justification for the exclusion of the next generation. They recorded, they wrote, they spoke the truth. More and more activists stood up for us, for me. Life is hard and not everyone is going to take your hand and give you a pat on the back for everything you do. They knew that in a society that viewed them as a commodity, they would have to fight for their own rights because no one else would. I will fight that voice inside that tells me to stay quiet. I will heed the other voice that says, stand up for what's right. See, words move hearts and hearts move people and people make change. Aren't these students just incredible? You can watch all of their speeches in their entirety at wjz.com slash oratory. Our judges had the daunting task of selecting the finalists from over 200 essays. And what you just saw clearly demonstrates the level of quality they found. Persuasive writing takes effort and passion, and performing for an audience takes courage. But public speaking has the power to inform minds and shape hearts. Nowhere is that more true than in African American history, where oration is a tradition and a vehicle for change. WJZ's Max McGee brings us one of the nation's most famous public speakers who found his voice right here in Maryland. Take a look. I have borne 13 children and seen most of them sold into slavery. And when I cried out with a mother's grief and none but Jesus could hear me, ain't I a woman? From Sojourner Truth, who asked, ain't I a woman, at a women's rights convention in 1851, to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who declared, I have a dream. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation 
to the sunlit path of racial justice. African American history is rich with orators whose words changed the world. But perhaps none is more relevant to this tradition than Frederick Douglass, whose presence at the podium helped change the national conversation about slavery. Born on the Eastern Shore, Douglass learned the alphabet at age 12 from the wife of his Baltimore slave owner, who swiftly brought lessons to a halt. Determined to read and write, Douglass learned any way he could by copying signs at the shipyard where he worked, even by challenging white children in his neighborhood to outspell him. Douglass would later refer to literacy as the pathway from slavery to freedom. And in 1838, he used the identity papers of a freed black sailor to escape to the North out of Havre de Grace. His public speaking career began with the abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison first heard Douglas describe his personal experiences with slavery. Astounded by the emotion Douglas drew from the crowd, Garrison wrote, I think I never hated slavery so intensely as at that moment. He asked Douglas to travel the world as an anti-slavery lecturer, and Douglas spoke boldly, often risking his own safety to do so. But perhaps the boldest speech he gave came in 1852. Invited to bring the keynote address at an Independence Day celebration, Douglas boldly asked, what to the slave is the 4th of July? This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems or inhumane mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean, citizens, to mock me by asking me to speak today? Frederick Douglass wrote a best-selling autobiography and advised President Lincoln, but it's his personal story and how he told it to a public audience that make him one of the most important public speakers of our time. And WJZ is proud to bring the tradition of oratory to our young people. Before we take a break, though, it's time to announce the third place winner. The third place winner receives $200 from WJZ and a $500 gift card courtesy of Toyota Financial Services. Here to announce this year's winners, we have former oratory competition winners standing by. Guys? And the third place winner is Taylor Mason from North Hartford High School. Congratulations. Job well done. And for all of you at home, here is a portion of the third place speech right now. And a reminder, you can watch all of the top speeches on our website, wjz.com slash oratory. We'll be right back. My aunt's grandfather clock strikes five, signaling it is time for Christmas dinner. The formal dining room is decked out with beautiful garland and an extravagant gold tablecloth. Each place setting is made with the finest china, the silverware shined by hand. My relatives fix their plates and take their designated seats in the modern equivalent of the Palace of Versailles. I saunter in behind them, only to be abruptly turned away and sent to every teen's Christmas nightmare. The kid's table. I trudge down the steps of the basement to see a few flimsy card tables with cheap paper tablecloths and folding chairs. As I begin to eat my food, I wonder why I cannot sit with the adults, even if I have so much to say. Children and teenagers deserve to have a seat at the grown-ups table because of their innate advocacy for positivity and inclusivity, qualities our world desperately demands. At eight years old, Mari Kopany wrote a letter to then President Barack Obama encouraging him to visit her town of Flint, Michigan. Since the switch of its source in 2014, Flint's water has been contaminated with lead. The residents cannot even drink a glass of tap water without risking their health. Safe drinking water has become a forgotten privilege among Americans, but Mari, now 13, has made it her mission to restore her community. When asked what her local and state officials were doing to solve the crisis, Mari exclaimed, Well, they never did fix it. So I said, Well, you have to listen to me because I'm a kid. Because Mari did not listen to the adults who discouraged her, over half a million dollars has been raised for water filters 
and school supplies for the children of Flint. Mari's tremendous contributions towards clean water for the citizens of Flint is one example of why children are the fuel for change in our communities. There are hundreds of thousands of kids across the U.S. who are like Mari, who have been doubted and pushed away, who have been deemed too small to make a difference. Time and time again, society says that children are our future, the trailblazers of tomorrow. You're watching the Black History Oratory Competition Special on WJZ. Brought to you by Toyota Financial Services, making life easier for youth. The Pratt Library starts every day thinking about you. Now we're bringing our sidewalk service to all of our locations throughout the city. Sidewalk service is a contact-free way for people to pick up items from our collection. I love the sidewalk service. So glad you're here. It's absolutely amazing. It's our way of serving the city of Baltimore and remaining as safe as possible. For more than 150 years, Morgan State University has positioned its graduates to grow the future and lead the world. Morgan students receive a world-class education, engage in meaningful research, and uplift their communities. Over 126 programs, conveniently available online or on Morgan's beautiful campus, designated a national treasure, there's something for everyone. Pursue your purpose, progress in your passions, achieve the promise of career fulfillment. Your Morgan experience awaits. Choose Morgan. Welcome back to the WJZ Black History Oratory Competition Special. For over a decade, the Reginald F. Lewis Museum in Maryland, African American History and Culture, has hosted the speech portion of the oratory competition, but of course, due to the pandemic, we were unable to meet there in person in 2021. So instead, WJZ's Avajoy Burnett is going to take you there right now for an inside look into some of Maryland's African American pioneers. When you think about Maryland and African American history, you probably think of civil rights advocates like Harriet Tubman, who conducted the Underground Railroad from the Eastern Shore. Or perhaps you think of Thurgood Marshall, years before he argued the landmark Supreme Court case Brown v. Board of Education, he spent his free time watching court cases in Baltimore. But Maryland's African American heritage goes well beyond any one particular subject. We're talking about the world of sports, science, and even entertainment. Almost 70 years before the Civil War, Baltimore County-born Benjamin Banneker helped Andrew Ellicott, think Ellicott City, to survey the boundaries of the future Washington, D.C. Basically, Thomas Jefferson had said that African Americans were of low intellectual capacity. So Banneker was very clear in speaking back, or as they say now, clapping back, to Thomas Jefferson to explain that his intelligence was an innate gift from God. Undoubtedly a genius, Banneker charted tides, predicted a solar eclipse, and once, to satisfy his own curiosity, built a pendulum clock completely out of wood that kept time for decades. Mother Mary Lang is the foundress of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, the oldest nunnery and the oldest element of African Catholicism in the country. By the early 1800s, there were more free black citizens in Baltimore than slaves. And seeing the dire need for schooling for African-American children, Mother Mary Elizabeth Lang opened her own school in her home in Bells Point. And many have since lobbied for her to become a saint. Before Muhammad Ali, there is Joe Gans. Considered the greatest lightweight boxer of all time, Gans shucked oysters before boxing paid the bills. And despite being forced to throw some matches to white opponents, he became the first African-American world boxing champion in 1902. Known as the Old Master, he was one of the first professional boxers to use strategy to win by studying the movements of his opponents. At three, he played drums and pots and pans. At 11, William Henry Chick Webb worked a paper route to save money to buy his first real set. And despite an injury that curved his spine, Webb moved his natural talents out of East Baltimore and up to New York, 
where he founded one of the most influential swing bands of all time. Even the Reginald F. Lewis Museum's namesake was a pioneer. In the 1980s, he became the first African-American to build a billion-dollar company. From politics to pop culture, many important African-Americans' paths came right here through Maryland. Just a few amazing people in our history there. This, of course, would not be possible without our sponsors, who also served as judges for this competition. WJZ would like to say thank you to our 2021 Black History Oratory Competition judges. From Toyota Financial Services, Zipporah Wiseboard, and Camille Kelly. From Morgan State University, Dr. Adele Newson Horst. From the Enoch Pratt Free Library, Kimberly Day. And finally, from the Reginald F. Lewis Museum, Joy Hall, and the Education Department. Thank you for your continued support. Now, I know you're all anxious to find out who the second place winner of this year's Black History Oratory Competition is, so let's get to it. The second place winner is going to receive $400 from WJZ and a $1,000 scholarship whew, gift card from Toyota Financial Services. So let's go back to our BHOC alumni to find out who won. And the second place winner is Tenny Adadiri from Eastern Technical High School. A huge congratulations. And don't forget, you can watch all the speeches online at WJZ.com slash oratory. All right, let's see some of that winning oration right now. See, being a black woman in America can feel like a bundle of contradictions. Wanting to prove that you belong in whatever room you're in and not be judged by what you look like and yet still being proud of who you are and not wanting to erase that. How do you wrestle with those things? Malcolm X once said in 1962, the most disrespected person in America is the black woman, the most unprotected person in America is the black woman, and the most neglected person in America is the black woman. And in the decades since, those words have continued to resonate a rallying cry for black women who felt sidelined in the fight for civil rights, ignored during the feminist awakening, and discounted even as their protests against police violence have earned that movement new attention. Black women have always been overseen and overlooked as a result of underestimation and underrepresentation. Yet, in the face of such challenges, generations of black women have learned to become solution oriented and resourceful, often making a way out of no way. And their political participation is proof of their history of survival. So, how do they do it? Some may ask. Well, to create an opportunity for yourself after facing discrimination, one must realize that their worth is what they believe it is and not what anybody else thinks. Next, black women like Shirley Chisholm had to realize that they'll be doing themselves a disservice and future generations who wanted to see at the table a disservice if they were not securing their seats. See, securing a seat at the table is using your voice. So in a world where black women were expected to stay silent, brave leaders like Shirley Chisholm chose to yell. And that's because it's not what others think of you, but how you think of yourself. If you believe that you belong somewhere, that you deserve a seat at the table, then make room and bring a chair for yourself. Today, we can all learn a valuable lesson from black women. And that is to be the change that you want to see in the world and never diminish the power of your words. See, words move hearts and hearts move people and people make change. Also, if your voice didn't have power, no one would be trying to silence it. So next time, don't wait to be given a chance. Instead, use your power and learn to take chances. You're watching the Black History Oratory Competition Special, only on WJZ. Brought to you by Morgan State University. Growing the future, leading the world. For more than 150 years, Morgan State University has positioned its graduates to grow the future and lead the world. Morgan students receive a world-class education, engage in meaningful research, and uplift their communities. Over 126 programs, conveniently available online or on Morgan's beautiful campus, designated a national treasure, there's something for everyone. Pursue your purpose, progress in your passions, achieve the promise of career fulfillment. Your Morgan experience awaits. Choose Morgan. Pratt Library starts every day thinking about you. 
Now we're bringing our sidewalk service to all of our locations throughout the city. Sidewalk service is a contact-free way for people to pick up items from our collection. I love the sidewalk service. So glad you're here. It's absolutely amazing. It's our way of serving the city of Baltimore and remaining as safe as possible. Welcome back to the Black History Oratory Competition Special. To compete, each of our high school students had to select one of three quotes and write an essay describing what that quote means to them. And as you've seen, these quotes have inspired some powerful and emotional responses. One of this year's quotes comes from Mary McLeod Bethune, an African-American educator whose life is filled with inspiration for all Americans in light of the unprecedented year we've lived through in 2020. A remarkable woman, an amazing patriot, an example for all. By the 1940s, Mary McLeod Bethune was arguably the most powerful African-American in the country. She advised five U.S. presidents, including FDR, as a leader of his unofficial but renowned black cabinet. And what advice would she give today after a year marked by a global pandemic, nationwide protests, and a historic election? For answers, let's look at Bethune's early life, the daughter of former slaves. She was born in 1875 on a cotton farm in South Carolina. As a child, she walked over five miles to school every day, and when she got home, taught what she had learned to her parents and some of her 16 brothers and sisters. In 1904 Florida, after being denied the chance to become a missionary, she founded a school today Bethune-Cookman University, with a dollar fifty and five girls who made their own pencils from burnt wood. Years later, when the local hospital denied treatment to one of her students because of her race, Bethune founded her own hospital. And in 1918, when the influenza pandemic gripped the world, the McLeod Hospital treated blacks and whites, everyone, even if it meant filling the auditorium with cots. Her biggest fight was for the right to vote. When she campaigned against Jim Crow era poll taxes and literacy tests, the KKK marched on her school. Defiant, Bethune sent the students to bed and flooded the Klan with light and singing as they passed by. The very next week, she joined 100 newly registered African Americans at the polls. Bethune's friend and contemporary, Carter G. Woodson, known as the father of black history, taught that we can look to leaders of the past to help us meet the challenges of today. She stands as a prism through which we see refracted the light of social justice, faith, community building, equity, and internationalism. And when we dive into Bethune's life, we can better understand what she left future generations in her last will and testament. I leave you love, I leave you hope, I leave you the challenge of developing confidence in one another, I leave you a thirst for education, I leave you a respect for the use of power, I leave you faith, I leave you racial dignity, I leave you a desire to live harmoniously with your fellow men. I leave you finally a responsibility to our young people. And it is that responsibility to our young people that brings us here today. Like Mary McLeod Bethune, we hope today's program has inspired you and filled you with hope for the next generation. Now let's go to Tim Williams for the moment we have all been waiting for. Tim? Nicole, I don't know how they did it, but the judges have chosen the winner. But before the big announcement, WJZ would like to say thank you to the students, the parents, teachers, and principals who all made this year's competition a reality. Thank you so much. So, without further ado, we are pleased to bring you the winner of the 2021 WJZ Black History Oratory Competition. The first place winner received $700 from WJZ and a $2,000 scholarship gift gift card from Toyota Financial Services. For the third and final time, let's find out who won. In the first place winner of the 2021 WJZ Black History Oratory Competition is Nefertiti Griffin from River Hill High School. 
Congratulations. What an amazing performance. Those of you at home, remember, you can watch all of the finalist speeches on our website, wjz.com slash oratory. We are so thrilled with our finalists and their fantastic orations today. With young people like these, the future is very bright. Students, remember that with education and passion, you can make a difference. We say to everyone at home, have a great night, and we'll see you back here next year. I stared straight ahead, my back rigid, pretending that I did not hear. However, I did hear. Did I care? If I cared, why did I not speak up? When did it become embarrassing to confront racism? During these several months at home, I had time to think and see what has happened to those who have chosen to fight back from their oppressors. It was only until large masses ceased being silent that others suddenly stopped to listen. People started pointing out the blatant wrongdoings that occurred around them. They recorded, they wrote, they spoke the truth. More and more activists stood up for us, for me. I think of Mammy Till and how she stood strong and spoke up for her son, Emmett Till. This boy was beaten, tortured, mutilated, murdered, and left in the Tallahatchie River in Mississippi like a worthless rag. Mammy Till dared to be courageous. She stood firm and showed the world the ugliness of racism, fear, and bigotry. This was the spark that changed not only the nation, but the world. Bethune told us to protest openly everything that smacks of discrimination or slander. The next time I heard a peer calling another that very word, my back went rigid again. But this time I spoke up and demanded him not to use such degrading language. The entire class was silent. The boy mumbled an incoherent response. By not speaking out previously, I had given my permission had soothed their conscience. Mammy Till's life during her time of loss and anguish embodied Mary McLeod Bethune's powerful and inspiring words. Miss Bethune taught me not to bow down to discrimination, hate, and racism, but to stand firm on what is right, even if I stand alone. I will not kneel in the face of fear, and I will not give discrimination a resting place. If we give them a little, how much more will they take? If we give them a pass, when will they stop? We must know. We have to stand strong together. Today I am here, standing courageously and free in the footprints of the matriarch, Mary McLeod Bethune, and I will not Sit silent. Thank you.